Sometimes we're against the algorithm and AI, but actually the algorithm kind of brings us closer together as well, doesn't it? Mark Zuckerberg would love me for saying that, right? <laughs> There's that AI optimism again. <laughs> I like the way you talk about AI as being an AI optimist. It's funny, it's almost like the AI takes more work than the human. Yeah. <laughs> as well as the fear of failure, which I mean, we're told time and time again when I listen to these entrepreneurial books and podcasts, you know, you've got to fail, you've got to fail. But I think, Katie, I think you've got a really good point that perhaps there's also the fear of success and what that means. No, I, I constantly have a, a fear of doing things that I know will be good. <laughs> I've never seen a negative comment on any of your videos, but maybe you have. I'm curious what your experience with them was and like how you deal with them. My wife is originally from Poland and she's always like, you're so British, you're so diplomatic. Why can't you just be controversial for once? You know? <laughs> Welcome back to Inside the Creator Studio, an origin story podcast about the world's best video content creators. My name is Katie. And my name is Mo. On today's episode, we have Mike Russell, who is a world-class audio producer. He's an audio mentor for Adobe and the creative director of an audio production services company called Music Radio Creative. He also runs a YouTube channel with over 300,000 subscribers where he teaches audio production. And we're going to talk to him about his origin story, his journey as a YouTuber, and why he's an AI optimist. This show is brought to you by StreamYard, a browser-based tool that lets you live stream to multiple platforms and record your podcast in studio quality. It's built for creators to make your job way easier. It's what we use to record this podcast. Okay, cool. Mike Russell, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Mo. Good to be here. <laughs> Dude, I like your shirt, I, Mike. <laughs> I always try to be bright and vibrant, you know. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I used to watch your YouTube videos when I started my podcast. I know I told you this over email, but like I watched all your videos trying to figure out how to make my first podcast. So it's it's such a like full circle moment to be able to interview you now, man. It's crazy. No way. That's super awesome. And, and now most of our podcast episodes are being made for us, right? With with all the tools that are being released all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Things have changed a lot. So let's start yeah. off with some, some rapid fire questions. What is your setup for this call? So tell us about your computer, your mic, your camera, your light, anything yeah, sure. else that might come to mind. So I'm sitting on a Mac Studio with the M1 processor. I'm super envious of anyone who has M2. I've got Elgato key lights all around me. They're super cool. I can control them from my Elgato Stream Deck. I've got a Mackie DLZ mixer to mix everything together so I can mix minus you guys and do all that cool stuff. I have got a Neumann U87 sitting right in front of me. Uh, it's one of the best studio mics, I think, out there. A lot of voiceover artists use it. It's condenser, does pick up a lot of background noise, but thankfully I'm sound treated by uh, various panels that are around the room as well. And for audio, I wear my lovely Bear Dynamic DT770 uh, Pro X headphones. Uh, so you guys are sounding really good today. So Sweet. What what was the last meal you ate today? Pizza, actually. Yeah, it's afternoon for me, so I have an excuse. I, I know for you guys, as we record, it's morning. So pizza in the morning would potentially be a bit weird, but maybe not. Cold pizza is good too, right? Yeah, I'm in New York. <laughs> we can eat pizza at any time. <laughs> we should. <laughs> Who were your inspirations when you started as an audio producer? Wow. When I started as an audio producer... I used to listen to a radio station in London, so I was just a little bit outside of the city of London, here in the UK, where I am right now. Uh, and I used to listen to the jingles on Capital FM, and I thought they were insanely, insanely cool. Uh, and then I got to work in radio with a producer who used to work at Capital Radio. So he kind of passed on all his knowledge to me. His name is Dave Wright. So big shout out to Dave Wright, who just gave me all of my audio knowledge back in the early days when I was a, a teen hungry for information. So everything with EQ, compression. And the coolest thing back in that time was that I could put myself through this box, this 19-inch unit, and make my voice go high-pitched and low-pitched and uh, have reverb and all that kind of cool stuff. And I, I'm showing my age now, but I was also cutting with uh, with razor blade and, uh, and, and tape, which is 
insane to think of nowadays, isn't it, with all the digital options out there? There is a return to film and such, so I I wouldn't say. I think think you're right on time. What hobbies have you spent the most time on this year? So I've spent a lot of time when I'm outside of my studio and outside of my sort of creation mode with, you know, feet under the desk, actually on a bike. So whether that's outdoors, cycling, I absolutely love cycling. I live in a place called the Isle of Wight, which is uh, right off the south coast of England. It's just beautiful. Apparently, I think Lonely Planet said it's the best place in the world to go cycling. But I also have an indoor trainer as well. Uh, so I, I train on uh, Zwift. For anyone who uses that, I love using Zwift. And uh, I've completed a few triathlons. So that's kind of been a sort of hobby of mine outside of work. Uh, and the thing that I guess most recently I'm most proud of is completing the London Triathlon, which has uh, probably famous for the, the murkiest, groggiest, greenest water to swim in. But apart from that, the cycle to Big Ben and back is absolutely insane and uh, run around the Auckland's also very awesome. So yeah, that's what I've been up to in my spare time. What are some books or movies that greatly influenced your life? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, So in terms of books, recently I've actually read a a book by uh, Stephen Bartlett, who's a very well-known popular podcaster uh, based in the UK. Uh, He's got a book called The Diary of the CEO, 33 Laws for Business and Life. And like just listening to his voice inspires me. So that has given me inspiration. But actually, I can call a specific part of this. I'm not much of a movie watcher. So my 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 other half, my wife will actually say I fall asleep during most movies. So it has to be really good for me to be to be grabbed by a movie. But in the in the book that Stephen Bartlett wrote, uh, Law 19 is particularly good because he starts off by giving away a lot of his podcasting secrets. I'm not going to spoil it or give it away, but. Like if you listen to the start of Law 19 in that book, it's insane if you're a podcaster. The, the attention to detail he pays in uh, making his, his podcast really pop, you know. That's so interesting. So for this podcast, um, like at the beginning of our podcast, we're always asking our editor to make like a little montage just of like all the highlight moments. And for that, I sent him Diary of the CEO like as an example, because his are so compelling. Like the, his first minute yeah. of his podcast is like, it makes you want to listen or watch it. It's amazing. Yeah, I totally agree. Incredible, right? It's like a, a trailer for the rest of what's coming up. It like hooks you in. It's like that YouTube algorithm, isn't it? The first 30 seconds yeah. is super important. I will give one thing away. So he split tests, thumbnails and titles, like before he even publishes the episode. So he's already testing that, you know, through, I guess, paid ads or something like that. So oh, cool. pretty incredible. Yeah. That's really cool. What, when's your favorite time or setting to listen to audiobooks or podcasts? Like, is it when you're walking? Is it flights? Is it chores? Or biking? Yeah. So um, I would say probably my my favorite time. I prefer, when I'm biking, I prefer to just have nothing. I just prefer to have everything that's around me. When I'm on a flight, I like to put on music so i like to just zone out and put on like uh i quite like trance so i listen to armin van buren he has like two hour mixes that will get me through long haul flights but audiobooks they tend to be my my busy thing or podcasts so when i'm when i'm doing something that's routine so it might be yeah just as monotonous as the washing up or even walking my dog dog walks are usually a big time for me because i just like wander around and that's a, a slow movement thing where i can really slowly pace around And I find that that's a time that I also get inspired. I actually, I've been trying to find these apps recently. There's a few of them around that will take AI transcriptions of what's being said in the show. And you can kind of highlight them and send them off to a a reader. Now I'm trying to find one that really fits with my routine because I find that I get so much info from a podcast. I I have to keep whipping my phone out and go, wow, okay, uh, this this timestamp, this was said, and I really need to remember that. So think a lot of companies are trying to solve that but um yeah I, I get a lot of learnings from walking the dog basically and listening yeah well let me know when you find that because i need it too i've <laughs> i've bought a physical copy or at least a kindle copy of a book when i've like listened to the audiobook and i'll be like okay i need to find from this timestamp where it is and the whole manual part of yeah your idea for that is definitely something we need. Definitely. With regard to audiobooks, I'm not certain of a particular app for that, but there's an app I've downloaded that I haven't actually used yet, but I've seen that it's highly recommended in certain places. It's called Snipped, S-N-I-P-D, uh, for podcast listening. And I think that has some intelligent thing where you can you can mark audio sections and it will give you text notes. So 
Yeah. Okay, I'm writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> Write it in my notes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's an AI tool for everything now, right? <laughs> I know, seriously. It's really crazy. Now, let's dig into your story a little bit. Can you tell us the story of how you got into audio? Like, where did it all begin? Yeah, so audio has been a part of my life since I can remember, really, since I was in single digits in age, because... I was always grabbing a tape. I was kind of, I guess I was a little bit like Macaulay Culkin, you know, running around, recording people, <laughs> speeding them up, slowing them down, and really annoying them. Uh, and then eventually uh, I, I listened to the radio and I got inspired by that. And as I mentioned in my, my quick fire questions, the radio station in London really inspired me. So I listened to a lot of DJs doing their thing. Uh, and then I, I just got really interested in, so how are these sounds made? You know, how are they doing that? How are they doing that effect on the voice or pitching things up and down or creating a, a sound image. And that was really the start for me. So I got into radio, uh, worked at various local, uh, national uh, and regional radio stations, uh, traveled a little bit doing radio as well. And then this really cool thing called podcasting came along. And I got into that like from a fairly early stage and started, you know, trying my own and then going to conferences where other podcasters would meet. And I was like, oh, there are other people who really like this stuff, too. And so it progressed uh, through time. And I, I think it's fantastic. And I'm, I'm sure video people would say this and, and people who are writing blogs would say that over time, things are progressing so much with the Internet and with technology, you know. And they always said, oh, you know, podcasting's come along, so now radio is going to stop. It's going to finish. And, and now we're seeing, like, you know, the advent of really good artificial intelligence, human-like voices. And we're like, okay, well, we're no longer going to need human hosts anymore. You know, I don't think that's true. But, like, <laughs> you know, it's just the next evolution of excitement for us. And, uh, yeah, so... That's a brief history. And yeah, I'm always future looking. So I'm always looking for the next thing. Yeah. So I'll ask more about that. Um, what was the moment maybe in your early career or just starting to get jobs that you knew that this was the path you wanted to take? And what was the first step? Because when I was looking on your LinkedIn, it looks like the earliest thing you have there and people update their LinkedIn, obviously, but it was your own company. So you were mm -hmm. talking a little bit about working at a radio station or working with one of the people that you really, um, he had been working at the radio station that you really admired. Talk to us more about that. Yeah. So I started essentially, I actually started before I even worked in professional radio. I worked on a radio station called Hospital Radio here in the oh. UK, which is like, a, it is a radio station that broadcasts to the wards in the hospital. And it was so old fashioned. They used to pipe the music through little tubes that would go to all the wards. It was like, insane old school technology um, that's where I learned to do the traditional razor blade cutting and editing of tapes um, so I, I got into it there obviously doing the production side of things but I guess there was a part of me that always wanted to be on the air that wanted to try out being a, a host a personality uh, and I did a lot of that and I, I went into radio and I always found it really exciting working in the production studio next door to the on-air studio um, but would try out various different on-air um, shows and really enjoy them. And what I really enjoyed the most was personality-driven radio. So radio where you would, you know, put something in, you'd do some prep, you'd do something entertaining, something funny, a stunt, you know, you'd call someone up, talk radio. I worked in talk radio for a while as well. And one thing that I found when I was working in radio was that a lot of radio stations – uh, in the UK, as all over the world, uh, certainly in the in the US as well, uh, became networked. So they became one brand across the whole country, you know, the same playlist, the same 10 songs, and you would play a lot of music and be told, don't speak very much. And when you do, make sure the next song is coming in underneath you as you're, you're finishing your sentence kind of thing. And I kind of found that, that radio boring. Uh, and then podcasting came along and I was like, oh, here's another chance to. So I guess I've always been driven towards creativity and whether it's speaking or making audio that excites people that's always been a big part of my my early journey nice nice um and this wasn't my next question but this was probably a divisive one for you if you had to pick radio or podcasts what would you pick <laughs> oh every day it would be podcasting right now that's easy to answer um you know i still have a passion for radio and where it's got me um and it's super exciting i mean they're definitely two different mediums that are you know coexisting together um 
What I find exciting about podcasting is you can have an idea and you can try it out. And if it's good, then, you know, it'll get listeners. And if it's not, it won't. And nothing gained, nothing lost there. Whereas with radio, you do a little bit have to go through the gatekeeper of, well, I think this is a good idea for a show. Let's try it out. Um, you know, so you can kind of be your own boss to a certain extent with with podcasting. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask, how did you get involved with Adobe? Yeah. So I've been using Adobe products since before they were Adobe products. <laughs> <laughs> so I I was editing audio um, initially when it became digital. I used a, a few different workstations. I think one of them was called, I seem to remember the very early workstation I used. It was a radio station uh, and someone introduced me to it. It was called SAW, I think, S-A-W. And it was just like this really cool early workstation that could mix together audio. And I was so impressed. And then I found Cool Edit Pro, and I thought that was absolutely insane. And then Adobe came and purchased that, and so I still kept using it and, and mixing things and making stuff. And it was probably around 2010 that I started my YouTube channel, and I just threw up a, a quick tutorial saying, these are my favorite radio imaging effects for the voice in Adobe Audition. And I left that video there for a few months, didn't think much more of it. Came back, had a look, saw that it had, you know, quite a few views. And I thought, well, maybe I should do another one then. So I did another one and that sort of organically progressed. And then, yeah, I, I just kept talking about Adobe Audition, really, and found that I suddenly became the person that people went to to learn about Audition, not through any, there was no intention there. I wasn't like, right, let's sit down and, you know, really master this software and make it happen. So it all happened quite organically. Um, and then, yeah, now I... I get to speak at some events on behalf of Adobe and, and, and do cool stuff like that and talk about their software and, and see exciting things. So it's, it's super cool. What That's was cool. going on in your life when you started that YouTube channel and what made you decide to start it? Wow. Oh my goodness. That's <laughs> such a different time. Yeah. That is like, that is like taking me way back now. So this was when I was still working in radio and I remember it very, very significantly. So Music Radio Creative, the company uh, I have that produces jingles and intros and audio bits like that, that was around, but it was very, very small scale. It was basically just my voice. <laughs> so <laughs> that's all it was at the time. And I was working in radio, so I had this, this cool little online business, early days, you know, selling my voiceovers. And I was I was a, a radio host, essentially, at the time. Uh, and I recorded a video, and I remember clearly that I did that. And I, I actually remember a, a specific thing that happened to me back in those days that made me realize that I wasn't just recording videos, to, you know, with the screen recording software and uploading it, and nobody was seeing it. Because one day I was in the radio station and one of my colleagues just came over and said, listen, I, I, I need to edit this. Can you come over and help me? And I said, yeah, of course, yeah. And they said, yeah, so I'm getting stuck here, here and here. I was like, yeah, no problem. So you, you need to do this, that and that. And then he turned to me and he said, oh, it's like watching one of your YouTube videos. And this was like 2011. This was way before like I was taking YouTube seriously. And I was like, really? And it was the first time a real person actually commented that I've seen a YouTube video of yours. And I was like, whoa, that was, I guess that was like a penny drop moment of like, the, the, maybe there's something to this. That's really special. Yeah, getting that real life validation. I mean, that, that must have felt way better than just getting likes or views. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I think as creators, we often have that struggle, don't we? Of like, we, we put this content out, but is anyone really watching it? And, you know, particularly now the way the algorithms can be, you know, sometimes you do what you think is an epic piece of content and it flops and it doesn't get very many views or, or hits or whatever you want to call them. And, and sometimes you'll do something that you just throw it away and you think, well, that I don't think that'll do very well. And it, it, it blows up for whatever reason it does. So, yeah, I mean... It's, it's exciting. It's always exciting. So, And from your perspective, how have you had to adapt your strategy on YouTube over the years? Like what's changed since 2010? Obviously a lot has, and I'd love to get some of the shifts that you've had to make along the way. Wow. Yeah. So much has changed. Um, I suppose, you know, one of the, the, the biggest changes, you know, from going from basically 
Adobe Audition, consistently Adobe Audition tutorials all the time, uh, long form tutorials. One of my, <laughs> a lot has changed and I'm also directed by my better half, Isabella, who's like an absolute pro at this stuff. Um, I've always been, I, I felt quite good at distilling information down to just what you need to know in the shortest time possible. So I always used to get that feedback, you know, that, you know, two or three minutes and I know exactly how to use that feature. Whereas someone else, you know, might do a video, there would be tons of other videos out there saying, well, hello folks, welcome to the channel and I hope you're going to subscribe and they'll ramble on for a minute before they get to that. Uh, and then I learned that actually YouTube does, if you're doing a long form video, it likes longer form videos. So try and talk a bit more. So I was like, whoa, how can I make this feature that I think I can do in two minutes? How can I make that an eight minute video? And I think, you know, storytelling is probably a big part of that, which I still need to learn. I, I don't think I'm very good at storytelling, but I would love to get better at that because I think it's a great skill. Also, the big rise in shorts, obviously, you know, with platforms like TikTok coming along and then YouTube saying we're doing YouTube shorts as well. Suddenly I'm thinking about, you know, how can I repurpose stuff? Or more specifically, actually, how can I create stuff that is dedicated to being a YouTube short? And and also, how do I categorize it? You know, if I can if I can talk about something in 60 seconds, there's an argument maybe that should exclusively be a short. And then there's the uh, topic, I suppose, for the content I create, uh, moving, morphing, and evolving with time. I suppose in the early days of the channel, I thought I was talking to radio producers and I was telling them, this is how you do this effect, this is how you do this. And then I suddenly found myself talking still to radio producers, but to podcasters. And then what, what blew my mind and in recent years going to conferences related to podcasting is I was not just finding that I was talking to podcasters, like the individual podcaster, but the number of podcast producers that would come to me and say, hey, you know, I've started producing a podcast. I, I watched your videos. I was like, wow. So, you know, the way the audience is moving is just incredible. And now, just recently in the last, well, in the last year, as we've all experienced, I have made a big pivot towards AI, and particularly AI in audio, because I see that's that's one of the ways it's going. Now, that doesn't mean to say people don't want to learn how to EQ a voiceover or how to remove noise, background noise. These are still common, common problems. But the fact of it is, AI is doing a lot of the work for us, but I, I know we could probably spend the rest of the episode talking about AI. Yeah. I am an AI optimist. <laughs> so I do think it's there to help us and, and to do good things for us. And, you know, as has been said many times before, I think it's there to take away the dirty, dangerous and dull jobs from us so we can be more creative human beings. And, you know, um, so I'm trying to right now, as well as staying in my audio lane and teaching audio and the, you know, the basics of audio and advanced stuff, I'm also trying to help creators understand how some of the AI tools can assist them in their content creation. And, uh, and I actually think it's fantastic because AI is doing stuff for us that we would never be able to do on our own. So we are able to tell a story in such a stronger way. So if we are good at audio, but we're no good at video editing or, or color grading a video, AI is starting to help us with that. If we're no good at designing a thumbnail, but now we've got the, the image generators like Dali that can create a great image with text across it. Fantastic. You know, it's only going to make us more creative. So the graphic designer who says, well, I'm being replaced because, you know, Dali is making all these cool images that I was doing. Well, now as a graphic designer, maybe you can, maybe you can also be a podcaster because that's getting easier. You know, you've got a problem with noise reduction. You just click one button and it cleans it all up. So... Yeah, super excited about the future. I like the way you talk about AI as being an AI optimist because I feel like I'm also an actor, so we've been really affected yes. by it in most <laughs> recent times. So I I wouldn't say I'm a pessimist. I'm just very fearful of it. So I like how you are spinning it in a way where it's like, oh, AI can take away a lot of the dirty jobs, and I think it's important for creators to be able to know all parts of the work that they are doing and not just outsource it to everybody, but to also be like, oh yeah, if you're a graphic designer and you're worried about actually getting work, you can become a podcaster. And then maybe that even brings in more attention to your work. And maybe you can teach other people how to do other things as well. So you kind of expand the scope and also, I don't know, like kind of give back to other people too and share your skill set. Um, I want to ask, what is your favorite part about YouTube, your favorite thing about being a YouTuber? 
I love I love the comments. <laughs> Just, oh, okay. I, I love looking at what people are saying. Um, I'm also very so I, I definitely suffer, as I know a lot of creators do, shiny object syndrome. So I'm like, wow, look at this, this is amazing. Look at this, this is amazing. And without YouTube in my life, I wouldn't have I'd just be this mad, crazy, bonkers person sitting in the studio going, Wow, on all my different monitors. Look at this, look at this, look at this. But actually, when I get that moment, I can actually distill it. And either if I get really jazzed, I can record later down some content about it straight away or if I've got a project I'm working on and I have a look at this moment I can you know put it over into my my notion board and say I'll come back to that eventually and then I come back to it and I create some content and I can I can tell other people about it so one of my biggest buzzes and the biggest thing I love about doing YouTube is telling other people about really cool stuff that's that's basically it <laughs> I love that I love that do you like engaging in the comment section? Do you find that you're constantly responding to people or engaging with people in that way? Or is it almost too overwhelming to yeah, go back? No, I, I absolutely love it. I really do. I think it connects me to my audience, uh, you know, and I've tried things like, you know, ignoring comments or, you know, having some help, some third party help with comments and stuff. And every time I, I've done that, I felt like a detachment from my audience. So to actually be there and I do read and respond to every single comment that comes in, uh, like obviously I have a, a management piece of software that does the, the co collates everything for me yeah. so I can see what's coming in. Um, but for me, that's super exciting. And, you know, most of the responses are just, you know, thanks very much or I'm grateful or that's really cool. They're just people saying thank you. Um, but also I, I get inspired. I get ideas from there because people will say, well, have you thought about this or have you thought about that? And I love that when I'm I'm doing a video on something that's new and I give my spin because it is only my spin on something. And someone will say, well, yeah, that's an interesting idea. But what about doing it this way? And I'll be like, oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm learning. I'm, I'm a student of my audience in a way you could say <laughs> I love that That's yeah. what great... about negative uh, comments I'm I've never seen a negative comment on any of your videos but <laughs> maybe you have I'm curious what your experience with them was and like how you deal with them that's really interesting so I actually all I do is like I guess you kind of as a creator you've got to let it wash over you right you can't just you can't take it to heart um so when something like that would come in i i would actually just thank them i'd, I'd be thank you I, I i'd just be grateful i'd just be like you know thank you for that you know feedback really interesting um yeah the, depends how bad it is because i think youtube is quite hot on having a filter now where it'll it it will get rid of the worst of the yeah. worst but still yeah occasionally stuff gets through or sometimes you know uh, stuff gets through where people are quite justified. You know, I, I did do something silly or I, you know, I presented something and it wasn't in the best way. And, and you know, they're right. So absolutely, I'm, I'm going to sort of say, yeah, do you know what? Yeah, made a mistake there kind of thing. You know, It's very Canadian of you. <laughs> yeah. no, or you could say very British, right? My, my wife always says that my wife is originally from Poland and she's always like, you're so British, you're so diplomatic. Why can't you just, you know, be controversial for once? You know? <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. And I also appreciate that on social media, you're being social and commenting on other people's posts as well. Like that's mm. how we connected for yep. this podcast is you commented on like one of our LinkedIn posts. I was like, is that the Mike Russell? Like, what's he doing in our comments? We don't like have like a direct connection with him. And then I just sent you an email and I was like, oh my God, he's just a really nice guy. Super cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, it's, it's good to be, you know, to be engaged. And like you say to, I think it was LinkedIn that we uh, connected. I, I absolutely love LinkedIn. I think it's absolutely awesome place for just finding out what's going on. Uh, and I love looking at the feed there and you can see what your other connections are doing and what they're liking. So, yeah, I, I think one of your uh, former or previous guests was Rob Greenlee. It might have been that he liked a post of yours. And I was like, that's a cool post. I'm going to respond to that. So, yeah, it's, it's it's funny how the, you know, we're sometimes we're against the algorithm and AI, but actually the algorithm kind of brings us closer together as well, doesn't it? You know, Mark Zuckerberg would love me for saying that, right? <laughs> There's that AI optimism again. <laughs> Seriously, you're so much more optimistic about it than I am. <laughs> I need I to learn it. from you. No, you mentioned Music Radio Creative a few times. So that's your audio production service company. Like, at what point did you start that? Uh, so initially it was, uh, yeah, 2005 that we became incorporated. But it didn't really take off and become 
Music Radio Creative as it is today until 2011. Uh, and that's when uh, my wife joined me because she had a different background altogether. She was working in banking and she came, she was on her maternity leave and we started working together and it was, it was like a dream combo. It's clearly meant to be. Uh, and she went, uh, she's got a lot of business knowledge. She's really good at that. And I'm the the snowflake creative with absolutely <laughs> no idea how to do tax returns. So <laughs> that, all that kind of stuff. And um, and we just kind of co- found we really complement each other so well. And uh, yeah, she got me out of my comfort zone a lot of times and still does. Um, but I do believe, you know, that getting out of your comfort zone is what helps you to grow and expand. And uh, it's really thanks to Isabella that I've you know I've done a lot of getting out my comfort zone and, and the business has grown from just me being a single voice on there to uh, what we have now which is over uh, 150 different voice artists singers musicians um, anything audio really it's exciting that is super cool what need in the market did you see when you started the company whoa that's that's a super cool question I love that so um Okay, it it happened. How did I start it? It happened because I had this pain point. I was a sp- aspiring voice artist, aspiring voice actor, and I was like, you know, how can I convince people to hire me or to use my voice? And it was, you know, this was 2004, 2005, this idea was bubbling away. So really the start of the internet almost. It was definitely before social media and Facebook. Then Google was only just popping up on the scene. Um, and so the the idea there was to set up a website and put a recording of my voice there and put a PayPal button underneath it. This was the very, very first Music Radio Creative and, and just see if anyone would buy it. And actually I was like, like everyone seems to be, or at least for me in the UK, Everyone in the UK seems to want to break America. So I was like, wow, what if I could like get my voice hired in America and like people could use my voice there? That would be insane. So I, I set up two parallel sites, one with a UK flag and one with a US flag. Sorry, no, no Canadian flag. I should definitely have thought of the Canadian one. Sorry, Mo. And, and, and then, you know, so I had these separate sites that were targeting these two different countries and two different audiences. And it was just the craziest thing in the world when I got my first order from America. I was like, wow, this is insane. And and that's really where it started. It was just to see if I could sell my voice online. But then it grew. So I know kind of what you're getting at. So where was the need in the market? Then it grew to um, not necessarily professional radio because they had their in-house team and that's where I learned my craft and, you know, external companies already doing that kind of stuff. So we found early on a great need amongst uh, internet radio stations, online broadcasters, online, I suppose, the early original creators who were trying to do things and they wanted their, their radio jingles, their DJ drops for their mix sets and things like that. And we were serving that market and we were... We were, we were changing things in a little way because before, if you wanted a voiceover and you wanted it mixed with sound effects, you'd have to find a voiceover artist, you know, call them up, ask what their fees were, and then you'd probably get, well, you know, where is it being distributed? You know, what's the audience and all of that? And we were like, well, no, these are, these are online creators. These are people who are doing things online. Um, can we standardize the pricing? So we, we put, I think we were one of the first, I'm quite comfortable saying, I think we were one of the first companies to put a buy now button next to a, a voiceover demo and allow people to, to do that. And then it grew with podcast creators and YouTubers and things like that. Uh, And then much, much later on, Fiverr came along (laughs) and then caused a controversy through the the voice uh, industry because they were like, not selling my voice for five dollars. And and so it goes on. And now the latest controversy is AI. Is it going to replace voice acting altogether? And, you know, it's it's interesting times. But I guess to, to go to that last point, I think there's going to be a great need for that stamp of 100% human created. Um, that'll be an interesting thing, I think, for the future to watch. Maybe that's going to be where the uh, the next trend happens, where, you know, yeah, I can generate my voice in a couple of clicks and writing a bit of text and it cost me a, a few cents, or I can go to this company, pay a little bit of a premium, but know that I'm getting a real human actor who's who's doing something special. I mean, I'm in full agreement, I think, I think the push is more, at least for consumers, to hear real human voices. I mean, I did find something on the internet of Carter from South Park singing um, 
Evanescence and that was incredible, but like that's not going to be everything that <laughs> it's not going to be every instance of AI taking over the market. You know, it's just going to be certain times. Oh, that's really cool when you hear that car- that character cover a song, but it's not going to be yeah. every Some voiceover. Of my favorite content is like these videos of President Biden, Obama, and Trump playing Minecraft together. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen these. I've it's seen amazing. Those. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't. I need to watch this now. <laughs> They're incredible. <laughs> and, and like you said, with Cartman singing the Evanescence song, I mean, this is this is a big thing because you can essentially, uh, well, there are obviously online tools that can take a uh, pop music song and split it out into stems. And AI can do that really well. You can get like the vocals, you can get the, the piano, the synth, the drums, the guitar, whatever you want and split it all out. So because you can do that, we're getting these remixes more and more all the time. And there are various tools now uh, that are have trained up voice models. So you can put in like some lyrics um, and change the lyrics into Michael Jackson. So, for instance, someone did with a weekend song. I, I think it's I, I Feel It Coming, uh, the weekend singing that, then put it through an algorithm and it came out sounding like Michael Jackson singing it. And I know that uh, Paul McCartney is actually going to be doing something similar with the AI recreated voice of John Lennon so that they can finish some unfinished tracks together. So I think that's really interesting. Wow. Yeah, that is really cool. Also, thanks for correcting that because I've never watched South Park. It is Cartman, not Carter. <laughs> Grant, <laughs> cue a clip of this song that I'm talking about. Uh, Mike, do you mentioned your, your first order coming through. Do you remember what it was? I have... No recollection, unfortunately, <laughs> of exactly what I said, but I, I think it was something to do with a radio station, an online radio station, and, you know, a set of liners that they wanted voiced. So, yeah, it's exciting. Now, you mentioned you have 150 voiceover artists now. I also saw on your website your team itself has about 13 people. Um, do you remember making your first hire? How did you know it was time? Yeah. So, I mean, gosh, that's, yeah, that's way back now. So Isabella does most of the hiring and all of that side of things. Um, so that would probably be a better question uh, for her. I'm, I, yeah, I'm going to defer that to her because I'm, yep. that's not me. <laughs> you sell voiceovers on your website and you, you offer a version of that service with AI voices at a more affordable rate. What went into that decision? Yeah, so I think with the AI voices that are more affordable, we can definitely see a space in the market where that is needed. And it's interesting at the moment we're testing to seeing how much demand there is for it. And there definitely is a demand for it. I think the the biggest thing that is there with AI voices uh, and the biggest thing that has to be done there is that people who order AI voices, they want them really, really fast especially if there's no production like sound effects or music behind them, you know, so that's an important expectation to meet. Um, but also what is interesting to say, so I've worked with a lot of AI voices in my audio production and we've got a, a bunch of different producers who, who work with them and they, the feedback we get and that I experience time and time again with these AI generators, they are really good. They are really human like, but often you're having to prompt them 15, 20, 30 times before you get exactly the take you want for the, um, the piece of production or for the client who's placed the order. You just you listen as, as an audio producer and you just know that's not going to fly. It'll say something in a weird way. It'll say something funny. It's kind of like the mid-journey where it's generating people with six fingers and stuff and you're like, oh, I have to generate that again kind of thing. So it's like, you know, you'll generate a voiceover, particularly when it's imaging. So, for example... The best music on Mix FM, like that. So I'd know how to say that. Whereas the AI would be the best music on Mix FM, like that. And you're like, no, 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 no. And if it was a human, you could just say, could you just, you know, really put emphasis on FM, like that. And then with the AI, you have to do F dot 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 M dot dot dot, like that. So it's like, and then it'll go F M like that. And you're like, no, 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 <laughs> F M, like. So it's, you know what I mean? Prompting, prompting, prompting. But I think. Audio AI is not the only space that's happening. It's it's happening with the image generators. It's happening with ChatGPT. You know, you'll get something back and you'll be like, oh, that's not quite what I was looking for. Make it shorter, make it longer, take out the hyperbolic language, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. It's funny. It's almost like the AI takes more work than the human. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like you were saying, I mean, it costs less maybe for the consumer, but at the end of the day, the hours spent on that sample 
is longer, maybe. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Um, so what I think a lot of people don't realize is that voiceover work and any sort of like vocal radio work takes a lot of breath control. Can you talk more about that and what you've learned from trial and error? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So I guess, well, breath control, but particularly making sure everything you record comes out well. So preparing yourself before you go into a session to record. So I think it's important to do a, a vocal warm up. I, I've got a friend of mine who sings opera and he says, go, ah, before you start recording and just stretch the vocal cords out. Uh, try not to consume loads of chocolate and try and drink like straight water or water with lemon, eat apples to get rid of the clickings and bits like that. And yeah, just in general, be relaxed, I suppose, is, is, the, is the best way to describe that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we talked a little bit about your first client, but who are the clients you generally have for these voiceovers? Everyone and everything, really. That's good. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, if it's audio, then uh, then we'll do it. We do. Uh, we have sort of, I guess, main branches of clients. So we have people who are working in radio from individual hosts uh, to online radio stations to commercial radio stations. We work with commercial radio uh, doing jingles for their stations, also commercials, promos, adverts, and things like that. So radio is a big segment. Uh, DJs as well, whether they're uh, real-life DJs who do a set in a, a bar or a nightclub or mixed DJs who upload to, to Mixcloud or Soundcloud or wherever. Um, we work with people like that. Uh, obviously, podcasters, online creators, YouTubers, streamers. It's a big part of people that we work with to get their sound absolutely right and their image and their audio and their branding spot on. And then I suppose outside of uh, those three areas, we also work with, with business. So it could be something as simple as a voicemail message, um, which is, you know, welcome to so-and-so estate agent for sales press one, you know, for lettings press two, that kind of thing. Uh, so we'll do that kind of stuff uh, to bigger picture stuff where you go into, like we've done uh, voices for theme parks such as uh, Chessington World of Adventures here in the UK or the London Eye. We've done the voiceovers uh, for the London Eye in the past. So yeah, really anything that needs audio, whether it's a voiceover, a produced piece, a jingle, whatever it is, piece of music, that's that's kind of what we do. Um you mentioned that, you know, Isabella, uh, your wife was involved with the company. I'm curious if, was she there for flight, like if on day one working on music radio creative or was, did she come in later? She came in, in 2011. So that was the time where she really came in and did amazing things and took it from just me, like selling my voice online to being a lot more. Yeah. Okay. And so like, what was that conversation with her? Like, do you remember it? Yeah, I do. Yeah. She was like, you got to, you, you got to, you got to put someone else on this website. Otherwise it's, <laughs> this is never going to grow. And I was like, oh, I'm not sure about that. And so the conversation was, um, we were all, you know, I was already, you know, getting inquiries, you know, can you do uh set of liners for this radio station? Can you do this? Can you do that? Uh, and then a radio station, I seem to remember actually, it was somewhere in, uh, in Africa, might have been in Uganda, actually. And they were setting up a brand new radio station for the area. And they were like, we want two voices. We want a male and we want a female. I was like, I can't do the female bit. So, you know, I was almost ready to say, well, let's try and, you know, point them to another direction where... And Isabella was like, no, no. She was like, you know, who does this... Sh uh, you do the breakfast show on, on the radio station you were on. And, and who does the mid-morning show? Ask her. She's got an amazing voice. And so I, I was like, really? Are you serious? Should I really do this? And I asked. And of course, she was like, yes, of course. And, and that was the start of hiring our second voice artist. And, and, and so it grew from there. So, yeah, she really pushed the boat out. <laughs> That's awesome. So you, yeah. you kind of told that story like you were kind of hesitant to reach out to these people. I guess that was like early in your business career. Is that something that you eventually learned to overcome? Was that actually a struggle? No, I, I constantly have a, a fear of doing things that I know will be good. <laughs> so, <laughs> I constantly get that all the time. The quote uh, from the episode. Yeah. Literally. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I constantly have a fear of pushing publish or or upload on things that I know in the back of my mind are going to work. Um, 
But uh, I, I don't know how else to, to describe it. But it's like where you know you're getting yourself in for something that's good, but it's going to require a lot of work. And, and doing this thing will will bring more, but it's going to require work. So obviously, yeah, taking on new artists required work. You know, initially I was the only audio producer, so I was making the demos, uh, put, uploading them to the website, doing all that kind of stuff. And Isabella was hiring, hiring, hiring. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa I'm getting so much of this. So I guess, yeah, if I were to analyze it now in hindsight, I'd say, well, it was fear, fear of generating all that new work, you know. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I still I still get that today where we do like, you know, events or sessions and and things or even when i i speak a lot i go to conferences and i speak and always like you know i'm kind of like oh should i apply for this because they, they they might say yes and if they say yes i i have to prepare this talk and i have to make sure it's perfect and i need to do lots of research and yeah i, I guess i'm maybe maybe if you were to psychologically analyze that maybe i'm just afraid of work so <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know i always wondered what people saw as like the value in a business coach or, or something like that but now i'm realizing like you know as humans we naturally fear things that you know require a lot of extra effort or where there's uncertainty and having like somebody that isn't you who's not like stuck in your head mm. telling you to do something and pushing you has is just like so valuable right yes I think that's that's great advice. It's like fear of failure, but also fear that you're going to do really good. And it might be a big deal and it might be something you weren't prepared for. Yeah, you know? I, I, I agree. I, I think there's a, a lot in that. Yeah. As well as the fear of failure, which I mean, we're told time and time again, when I listen to these entrepreneurial books and podcasts, you know, you got to fail, you got to fail. Don't be afraid to fail because that's how you eventually succeed. But I think, Katie, I think you've got a really good point that perhaps there's also the fear of success and what that means. Yeah, that, that, that's deep. It's deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sort of on that path, because you are at a point in your career where you are experiencing a great deal of success, how do you decide what to take on and what not to take on as a creator with all different sort of I don't know. I mean, you have your business, you have YouTube, you have other people within your business that can take on different voiceovers. What do you decide is for you? And what do you decide that you don't need to take advantage of because you're not as hungry for work in the way that a lot of young people or people starting out are? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think uh, I need to look at what it is that I'm good at but also, you know, generates business as well. So like, I, you know, I can spend all day cycling, but that might not, you know, I'm never going to be a Mark Cavendish or a Tour de France pro. So that's, <laughs> it's not going to pay the bills. So um, I am fortunate in that I do work that I genuinely enjoy and I, I get a passion from. And if I can help people uh, and that can create a viable business, then that's that's great. Um, I'm also fortunate that I work with a great business partner in my wife, Isabella, and we Every year we set our priorities at the start of the year. We have a sort of New Year's Eve or maybe the day before New Year's Eve, we'll have a little bit of a meet and we'll, you know, do the big mind map and the chart for the year ahead. Okay, what are the priorities? What are we focusing on this year? And obviously that can be adjusted and aligned as, as we go through the year if things change or things come up. You know, uh, I mean, that, you know, I, I, I think I didn't get into ChatGPT until January. So I was a bit of a late adopter. You know, some people were right there in November 2022. So it's kind of like, yeah. Yeah, we planned everything in late 2022, and then suddenly this AI pops on the scene. You're like, oh, we've got to adjust and accommodate for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, my number one priority and the, the thing I do the most uh, is YouTube right now. So like, that's where I put most of my time. And, you know, it's funny if most people ask me what I do, you know, if it's outside this kind of bubble that we're in now of content creation and online and all of that. It's just, you know, someone I meet in regular life. Um, they'll say, what do you do? Uh, sometimes I just say I'm a YouTuber because it's easier than saying, well, you know, I make jingles and, you know, I teach people about how to make jingles and all of this. It's just, I'm a YouTuber. Oh, right. Okay. What do you YouTube? Uh, well, and then you can, that's kind of almost like your card in a way. Well, certainly it is for me. It's like, well, you know, type my name into YouTube and you'll see what I do. And then it's, it's easy to sort of break the ice without 
you know, having people say, I don't know what on earth you're talking about. I've never heard of this before. So, <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah. Times have changed, huh? Like, would you be able to say I'm a YouTuber like 10 years ago? Definitely not. Or people wouldn't take you seriously. They'd be like, what? Really? You're just messing about in your bedroom. And it's so funny, actually, Mo. That's that's such a good point because it's, it's changed so much. And, uh, you know, I got an eight year old son who is just determined to follow this path as well. And obviously, he sees what I do. I help him a lot with what he does. But it's cool for him and his friends. It's cool. It's like you ask them, what do they want to be? And they're like, I want to be a YouTuber. And I think that's, that's cool. That's really exciting. That's great. And, you know, bottle that passion because it's just like me when I was a kid. It's like, what do you want to do, Mike? It's like, I want to be like, well, my answer would, I want to be on the radio. I want to be a radio presenter, you know. So, that's kind of changed and moved along to to this kind of uh, experience. But of course, when I got into YouTube and when a lot of early people got into YouTube, um, you know, they they didn't see a path to monetization. They were doing it simply out of passion, um, you know, unless there was some kind of clever business idea behind putting videos online. But there's certainly no monetization from Google or anything like that. And now it's kind of the other way around where, you know, the young people getting into it today are like, oh, you know, if I become a YouTuber and I get as many subscribers or maybe more than Mr. Beast, you know, I'll be making millions of dollars. And this is kind of like the big driver. You know, my son obviously loves Mr. Beast and, you know, all his friends talk about Mr. Beast, uh, you know, and he's an example, in my opinion, of like one of the greatest content creators out there. He does everything. And I, I will often look to, to Jimmy to see exactly what he's doing on YouTube and say, wow, he's doing this now. One of the things I've seen him do recently, which is incredible, is multilingual audio on YouTube. So where he's uploading different dubbed tracks to his videos. So he, he, he went out and created like, you know, two or three or four different channels like Mr. Beast Espanol in Portuguese. But then YouTube released this feature where you can have it as like a, a track on your on your same video. And so what he started to do now, which I'm really curious about, is he's removed all the text from his thumbnails. And now it's just an image of him with something exciting going on in the background. I'm like, that's so cool. He is totally going for the uh, the multilingual audience there. And I think that's that's so smart. One question I have is what will not change? change as AI becomes more and more a commonplace in creation? Like, what are the skills or traits that creators should develop that will always be useful? Hmm. Um, I'd like to say the ability to conceive an idea. But then, you know, I say that now, but I'm not so sure I could back that up saying that'll be a long-term thing. So right now, you know, if we type into, say, an image generator that uses AI, uh, you know, create me a picture of, um, I don't know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer um, skating on ice, right? You know, we'd have to think of that situation to make it real. It would be really hard for an AI just to think, I'm, I'm going to make Rudolph skating on ice because that'll be funny or interesting. It's like, that's a human thought, right? So the human creativity, the, the thought of, I want to do this idea. I still find when I, I type into things like ChatGPT, actually the ideas that come out of it are only as good as the prompt that you put in. And you, like we've discussed earlier, you might have to go through... 10 or 20 different iterations before you go, oh, that's that's a good idea. Let's let's go with that kind of thing. So I think the human human thought and creativity is the thing that's going to last. But I wouldn't want to back that up with longevity because I don't know for how long that's going to be the case. When we listen to people like uh, Sam Altman, Elon Musk speak, and they're like, well, obviously the goal is to get AGI. And Sam Altman has actually outwardly said, I would consider an AGI to be something that will, and he's used the medical profession as an example, that will make medical discoveries that humans have not done. So, you know, if an AGI is going out there and making medical discoveries that a human couldn't, then sure as heck it can come up with creative ideas that a human couldn't as well. So, and then we're all doomed. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll change my thought uh, from optimism yeah. to pessimism. <laughs> He's coming in the Katie camp. <laughs> Character development in one episode. Um, what changes or advances are you hoping for in the audio field? Maybe in the next 10 years, 20 years, having to do with AI or not having to do with AI? 
Mm, the changes and advances. So, yeah, obviously, AI audio cleanup is a really exciting space right now because I think it enables creators to not have to worry about what kind of microphone they've got, what the environment's like, and all of that. And they can just plug in, hit record, and know that they've got an AI button that's going to clean that up afterwards. So I think that's great for democratizing content creation, particularly in uh, countries where it's harder or areas where it's harder to get really good quality equipment. I'm thinking of like regions of Africa and places like that, and to a certain extent, India as well, where there will be, well, certainly in India, billions of people who want to create content but might not be able to get the the fancy high-end microphone. So to have AI cleanup, And also, actually, one thing I'm excited about that's happening right now is AI dubbing, uh, just as we mentioned earlier on, is the fact that, yes, a content creator in India can create content in Hindi and have it translated into English, into French, into Spanish. Or, you know, someone, uh, you know, sitting, uh, you know, in an office in Doha can record a podcast in Arabic and have it go around the world in English, in Mandarin, Chinese, and all these other languages. I, I think that's an incredible development in the audio space. And that's pretty much possible right now. Um, I'd also like to see from a musical side, I'd like to see it become easier and easier for people to create amazing music without deep musical knowledge or needing to know music theory. And I think that will also be a, a thing to watch for the future, too. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, if you could give a few short like bullet point pieces of advice to people who are educators, uh, like as creators, kind of like you, like what would you tell them? to craft like good lessons. The, I, I think the biggest thing is, is don't hold anything back. You know, give it all, give the secret sauce because I think that's the biggest fear, isn't it? As creators. And you know, I've heard, you know, people I really respect who are creators say the same thing. Uh, for example, Pat Flynn is like, just give it all away, give it away for free. And you know, people, there'll, there'll always be demand because people will always come to you. You think if I give it all away, no one's going to pay me because I've given it all away, but actually people will come to make your, your life easier. So mm. they'll say, listen, you know, I, I watched that, you know, 20 minute video you did where you broke it all down, but can you just do it for me or, you know, can you just consult with me on a one on one session and and teach me because you know, so there's always opportunities. And the more you give away, if you've got like if you've got the really, 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 really secret, that's the good stuff. I don't want to tell anyone how to do that. That's probably the stuff you should be telling people because that's the cool stuff that will make people go, Wow, you know, she really knows what she's talking about. He really gets it, and then they'll hire you and then they'll work with you. So I think the biggest thing is just give it all away. Don't hold back. And, um, you know, it sounds a bit cliche, but enjoy what you're doing. You know, I've gone through definitely points in my career where I've done stuff and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not enjoying this, but like, I've, I've got to keep it going. I've got to keep, keep doing this, you know, started this, this little series and, you know, I'm not feeling it. It's like that failure thing, isn't it? You know, I've started podcasts. I've done events in the past that have, you know, peaked and then disappeared. And it's like, that was all part of a learning journey. And it's funny how dots connect later on in life that you don't realize at the time. So you think you're doing something and you think, oh, that was a bit of an epic fail, you know. But then you look back and you say, well, because I did that or because I went to that event that I thought meant nothing, you know, I met these people. And then, you know, five, ten years down the line, you know, those people are still friends and and help you or whatever. So I'm a big firm believer of there's always a reason to everything that happens in life and just do things, enjoy and have fun and and give it all away. I hope that helps. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. Um, So during the podcast, we like to end it with um, sort of paying it forward. So can you shine the spotlight on another creator? Um, who else should the audience or your audience in particular watch? Oh yeah. So gosh, there's, there's tons of people, but I mean, uh, again, this is going to sound cliche, but I love Nick Nimmin. (laughs) I think he's awesome. He's such a great, uh, YouTube creator and he's a shining example of not only saying, I'm going to teach you how to do this, but actually demonstrating with his channel that he does it because the amount of views he gets, the, the way his subscribers have gone up over time. I've obviously known Nick for a while, uh, is just incredible. So he's not just saying, you know, I'm going to teach you how to YouTube, you know, but he's got like, you know, a thousand subscribers. That's not the case. 
He's like teaching how to YouTube and he's doing it himself and he's doing it well and he's putting out less videos than me and I think I think he's onto something with that, you know. <laughs> less videos but more quality, right? So, yeah. Oh my gosh. So, Nick, yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> What's a piece of content that you're obsessed with right now and why? That I'm producing or that I'm watching? Or that you're watching. Um... So I really love watching what's going on in the AI space. I'm really into like all the latest AI news because there's just so much of it. And so again, I could pay it forward with this. I, I'm a big consumer of Matt Wolf's YouTube channel. That's Matt Wolf with an E at the end of his name. He's incredible. He's he, I don't know how he does it, but he's on top of everything week in, week out. And Friday rolls around, you can guarantee he'll roll out a video with all the updates. And uh, yeah, he's he's my go-to for everything in AI. Love it. Awesome. Um, any final words that you want to leave the audience with? Just keep doing it. Just keep doing what you're doing. Love it. And don't worry about AI. It's it's here to help. And, you know, if it does eventually take over, well, we'll I'm sure it'll figure out how we have like a nice beach and whatever it is we want. So, yeah, it'll be yeah. good. And where can people find you on the internet? Uh, best place is my YouTube channel. Uh, so youtube.com slash at Mike Russell. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Mike, for being on today. It was a pleasure and so fun. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. Likewise, Katie Mo. Awesome. This episode was recorded with StreamYard. If you want to record a podcast like this, check out the link in the description to get started. Thanks for joining us on Inside the Creator Studio. See you next time.